We're going to stop trying to understand the mysteries. All right. Okay, so welcome. Uh, we're having weird audio problems that seem to come and go. Hopefully they will stay away now. Uh, so this is session two, the tyranny of the storage hierarchy. Are we excited? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So I have like 80 slides. I'm not going to try and get through all of them. Um, so the remainder of the slides that I don't get through, you can read on your own. Um, again, it's an experiment guaranteed to fail. We were experiencing that up till about a minute ago, uh, having exciting audio problems. Make sure if you're out in TV land anywhere, um, if you are on something where you can talk, don't and mute yourself. Uh, slides if you need them. Um, it's a good idea to have them in case anything goes wrong. Uh, so I'm going to add this in. Um, so you can go to this address. Uh, nine, it, so it's zoom.us slash little j as in jacket slash 979-158-478. Um, so for having audio problems, it should be better on Zoom. And you're on a different Zoom, right? You're on the other Zoom. Yes. Do you have a question? And that is not on. No, it's not, because that's a, that's a I just, I literally just added that to the slide a few minutes ago. All right, so here's YouTube, right? Just go there and search for supercomputing in plain English, where in plain English is all about word. Uh, we got Twitch, twitch.tv slash site2018. Uh, we got the Wowza opportunity there, uh, blah, 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 blah. We, if, in the last resort, if the phone bridge is all you've got, um, it's, it's here, it's available, and we are on it. So you won't, uh, you'll be able to hear us, but we can't hear you. Make sure you mute yourself. When you have questions out in TV land, send them to supercomputing in plain English. It's all one word. Uh, at gmail.com, and Debbie is monitoring the uh, Gmail address and will yell your questions at me out loud. Um, if you have never been here before, you have to fill out the talent release form. Uh, make sure you get that filled out, or if you don't want to fill that out, uh, then you have to sit in the back away from the camera and not make any noise. Either way is fine. Uh, here's the schedule. We all know this by now. Uh, thanks to all the folks who are helping. Uh, everybody is pitching in to make this magic happen. Again, it's an experiment guaranteed to fail. Are we excited about our failure? Yes. Nothing's better than failure. That's right. Okay. So, uh, all kinds of exciting events coming up. Let's get right into it because we've got nowhere near enough time. So, we'll talk about the storage hierarchy. A little bit of this will be recapped from last week. Um, and then we're going to start diving a lot deeper. Um, there's only a little bit of code examples this week. Um, but. Uh, we'll have more code examples as the semester goes by. Um, we will almost certainly not get to hard disk, and we will definitely not get to virtual memory. I don't think I can move that fast. Although I will try and talk very fast, because there's nothing more fun and exciting than trying to get auto captioning to work when I'm talking a mile a minute. Okay, so we remember from last week, we talked about the, this idea that fast things are expensive, and if they're expensive, we can't afford much of them, Slow things are cheap, and so we can have plenty of them. So fast implies expensive, implies small. Slow implies cheap, implies big. Um, and that will always be true because anything that doesn't fit that rule, no one will buy. So as soon as something doesn't fit there, then people stop buying, right? Which is why you don't have lots of floppies. Uh, well, you may have a big crate full of floppies in a closet somewhere, but you're not reading them very often, right? So there's my laptop, there's the numbers. We talked about this, that was just to prove that I was a liar. Um, it turns out I am not a liar, isn't that nice? Okay, um, registers. So registers are where data live when they're being used right now. So if I'm gonna add two numbers together, the add end will be in a register, the aug end will be in a register, and when I press the magic add button, the sum will end up in a register, okay? Um, and, uh, by the way, that's slightly a lie, but that's true enough for our purposes. And registers are super duper fast, and they're also super duper expensive. So I mentioned that, um, and I'll roll back a couple of slides, I mentioned that um, in this table, you know, we've got about 11, 10, 11, okay, yes, question from TV Land. Uh, just a comment. Yes. They are saying that the video is not loud enough. I'm not loud enough? Yeah. Okay, well. Um, I hope the folks in the room don't mind as I take it up another notch. I am perfectly capable of having my voice carry. Is it very not loud enough or slightly not loud enough? We were they carefully. Just to please increase volume. Okay, I'm going to try, but um, 
The last time we, we were asked to take it down, and by last time I mean like five minutes ago. So we'll look at audio settings. And I'm gonna take the mic up just a little. Is that better? I'm gonna hope that's better because I don't have all day to spend on that. Okay, so hopefully that'll do better, but I will be as loud as I can be. This may be a little painful for those of you in the room. Okay, so hardly any registers at all, and maybe that's already too many. I guess I can advance now. There we go, okay. So um, there was a picture of what I just said, right? Put it, put and the add end in register zero, put the aug end in register one. They go through the magical adder circuit and out comes a sum in register two. Um, by the way, I've obviously massively oversimplified. Is anybody here an electrical or computer engineer on experience? Nobody, okay, so I can just lie through my teeth and pretend I know it. Okay, you are, but <laughs> you're on my team, so I'm hoping you won't reveal that I don't have the things that you would talk about. Okay, so. Nowadays, um, there aren't much in the way of registers. I looked this up. By the way, it is not trivial to find this information. Um, you can spend a good deal of time uh, going around on the web and using various uh, search engines. Eventually, what I found was a place on the web that said that Haswell, which is the generation of chip we have in our current supercomputer here at OU, it's one generation behind the latest generation of server chips, two generations behind the latest ver um, version of desktop chips. So Haswell has two sets of 256-bit vectors at 168 of those um, registers each. So 256 bits, divide that by eight is, what is that? That's, uh, so that's 32, uh, wait, is that right? Ah, uh, never mind. Anyway, it's a lot. Yes, 32. Uh, 168 instances of 32 of um, 8 byte register. I get that right? No, nah, that's totally wrong. Anyway, it's a bunch, right? So I came out with about 10,000, about 10 kilobytes of registers. That's actually way up. It's not too many years ago that you had less than a kilobyte of registers total. Um, and you can see, right, um, here's um, Itanium 2 has about 2 kilobytes. IBM Power 7, which is already a couple of generations behind now, but I, didn't, uh, I wasn't able to find IBM Power 9 numbers yet, uh, is about seven kilobytes worth of registers. So not that much, right? How many of you remember the good old days when a few kilobytes was considered a lot? Okay, how many of you do not remember those days because you were born more recently than that? So in 1970 Mumble, when I got a TRS-80, my dad got me a TRS-80, I was the first geek on the block to have my own computer, uh, it came with four kilobytes of RAM. Um, I don't know exactly how many registers I had. I think it had something like eight or 16, um, I think they were either eight or 16 bit registers. So it had like less than 100 bytes worth of registers back then. Okay. So the numbers have gone up, but you notice they haven't gone up that much, right? Back then you had four kilobytes of RAM. Now I have 12 gigabytes of RAM on my laptop. And by the way, this is the cheapest laptop I could manage. Right? So, all right, why so few? It turns out having more registers doesn't help. Um, and there was actually a study done about this. Uh, I don't, did I mark the year? I forgot to mark the year. There was a study done about this just a few years, oh, 2011, here we go. 2011, there was a study done on this, and they found that um, once you get beyond a handful, a relative handful, a few dozen registers. Um, adding more registers has only a very modest effect on your overall performance. So in fact, they said 68 is ideal, and half of that gives you a performance penalty of 5%. So um, you can really cheap out on the registers, because having a lot of registers turns out not to help very much. Yeah. That's good to know. Now, yes, question from TV Land. I'm getting a lot that they're saying it's too loud now. <laughs> I know. I don't know. Okay, well, I don't have the self control to turn down my own volume, so yeah. give me a moment. And I will try very hard to turn down the gain on the mic. Uh, that's the best I can do. And, and from here on out, 
Um, turn down the volume on your laptop is the best I can give you. All right, let's talk about cash. Uh, screen thing here, hang on. Okay, there we go. All right, so what's cash? Hit slide. It's a special kind of memory where data resides that are about to be used or have just been used. Good, excellent. All right, now, um, what's the rule about fast? Fast things are expensive and expensive things are, say it again. Somebody said it. You keep whispering it. Expensive things are small, okay? All right, so um, cash is not as fast as registers, but it's still much faster than RAM, okay? And it's way more expensive. In fact, um, the difference in speed is not proportional to the difference in price. Um, cash is super duper expensive. So when data are in cash, then they can get into the registers quite quickly. When they're not in cash, then it takes much, much longer. Um, and um, everything here, I'm sort of pretending like there's only one cash, but it turns out that's not actually true. Um, so here's a picture from last time, right? So this was for my laptop. My laptop can chew through over 650 gigabytes per second. Uh, my cache can feed the data um, at about 46 gigabytes per second, which is less, obviously, quite a bit less, but much better than what my RAM can do. Okay. Now, even that is semi-nonsensical because it turns out we don't just have one cache. Um, a typical CPU today has at least two. Three is basically normal, and there are now CPUs you can buy that have four levels of cache. Okay. So why would they do that? Why would they have level upon level upon level of cache? So if you've got this level three cache, who is it faster than? Hmm? No, it's the other way around. The lower the level, the faster it is. Because notice, which is bigger, level one, level two, or level three? Bigger. Who's bigger? So level three is the biggest, but if it's the biggest, what it must it also be in order to afford it? it? It has to be the cheapest, and if it's the cheapest, it has to be the slowest, right? So level three is faster than RAM, but it's slower than level two. Level two is faster than level three, but it's slower than level one. Okay. So level one is the fastest, but if it's the fastest, it's the most expensive. If it's the most expensive, then it's the smallest. Level two is not as fast as level one, so it's slower, therefore cheaper than level one, therefore bigger. Level three is slower than level two, therefore cheaper than level two, therefore bigger than level two, and then RAM is slower than level three. And if I had a level four, I could slip it neatly into that same pattern. Okay, so far so good? And notice, Level one is about the size that my RAM was back in 1970 Mumble. It's actually bigger than my RAM was back in 1970 Mumble. In fact, I, I wheedled my dad into spending, I think it was back then, $200, which in 1970 Mumble was a lot of money, for buying me the level two upgrade, which got me 16 kilobytes of RAM. And that computer back then, the RAM, was smaller than the level one cache is today. By the way, this is fairly common. Um, you can see this, so the power chips, level one cache is about 32K. Also, a weird thing they do at level one is they split into two separate caches. There's a data cache and an instruction cache, right? So there's code and there's data, and they're done separately. At the other levels of cache, they're all mixed together. What they call a unified cache. So on the Skylake, which is the latest flavor of Intel server chip, next to latest flavor, of Intel um, desktop chip. Because now I believe, uh, I believe KB Lake has been released for desktop systems. You can see the level two is bigger, okay? Um, both level one and level two on these chips, and this is fairly common, both level one and level two on these chips are separate for each core. Each core has its own level one cache, its own level two cache. Level three on the x86 chips typically is shared among all the cores. 
um, which makes for all kinds of interesting effects. We'll, we'll get to that presently. Okay, so similar kinds of things. Yes, question for TV Lab. Is the optical number of registers a function of the numerical system binary, or is it due to the electronics? Is the op optimal number of, um, of registers a function of the kind of math you're doing? Is it because of binary? What would, can you read the second half of the question again? Red, okay. Is the optical, optical, optical optimal? number of registers a function of the numerical system binary, or is it due to the electronics? I think it's due, uh, well, um, it's not a function of the numerical system, no. Um, I think um, the idea is that you're constantly having to pull the data in, but more than that, in pretty much every assembly language today, every machine language, the thing that actually gets run by the computer, um, the individual instructions have to say which register to use. And at some point, you're not getting more value by having more registers because just because you can say the names of different registers doesn't add any value. Um, and in particular, um, you can fill up all of these zillions of registers you might have, but then you're leaving the old registers that you have that you used a while back idle. So it's not winning you anything. It's not a permanent place to put anything. It's just at the last moment when you move the data into the registers. Um, and that's because all these registers have to be tied to circuits that actually do the calculation. And they're physically connected to them. Okay, that was a complicated answer. All right, why do we have multiple levels of cache? Because they have different performances. Um, so I just looked up Skylake last night. So this is fresh and hot right off the press. I found a, uh, some numbers for Skylake last night. So level one cache, the time it takes to move data from level two into level one is four to five cycles. So if you've got a two gigahertz chip, that's gonna take you two to two and a half nanoseconds, billionths of a second. Um, level two is 12 cycles, or on a two gigahertz chip, that'd be six nanoseconds. I picked the two gigahertz arbitrarily simply because it made the dividing easier. If I said, oh, on a 2.15 gigahertz chip, that would just be kind of a pain to do the math. So this made it easier. Level three is 42 cycles. And to come from RAM, that's fascinating, 42 cycles plus 51 nanoseconds. Right? And 51 nanoseconds at two gigahertz is 102 cycles. So 144 cycles total in the case of a two gigahertz chip. So the real question is what could you have gotten done while you were waiting for data to come from there. So while you're waiting for data to come from level one cache into the registers, you could have been doing over 100 calculations. That's how long it takes. The equivalent of over 100 calculations. While you're waiting for data to come from level two, you could have done almost 400 calculations. While you're waiting for data to come from level three, you could have done over 1,300 calculations. While you're waiting for data to come from RAM, you could have done over 2,000 calculations. Yes? But I have one of the viewers ask, level three cache, shared and linked all cores, can I have more explanation what cores means? Oh, what are cores? What are cores from last time? Did we talk about this last time? Oh, we didn't, okay. So what is the, okay, how many of you have heard of multi-core? Okay, what does it mean? What does it mean for a chip to be multi-core? Everybody's shaking their head. No one wants to volunteer. Okay, so um, a chip, in the olden days, the chip was the brain of the computer, right? So is that still true? Now, the chip has multiple brains, right? So I want you to imagine in your head, you don't have your regular brain, but you have two brains sitting in your head side by side. Right? So far, so good? Everybody's got two brains. That, oh, wait, wait. Let's go better. Let's have four brains in our head side by side. Is that good? Four brains? Wait, wait, wait. Let's not stop there. Let's have eight brains stuffed into our heads. And by the way, they're getting smaller now. But imagine that the, the, uh, all of the neurons can be made smaller and smaller every couple of years. And so you now have eight brains in your head. Wait, 
We could go further. Let's put 16 brains in our head. Can we do that? Have 16 brains in one head? Wait, wait, let's have fun. Let's go to 32 brains. So today, AMD will sell you a chip with 32 brains in it, right? In one chip, which raises the question, by the way, so is it good or bad to have multiple cores, multiple brains in your head? Would that be good or bad? Good. Okay, how many of you voted to be good? How many of you voted to be bad? How many of you voted depends? Okay, so what would it depend on? If you had 32 brains in your head, what would it depend on whether it was good or bad? What do you think? How positive would be negative? Ooh, right, so they've got to be able to communicate with each other to get anything done, right? Okay, because if you had 32 brains in your head and they never talked to each other, that'd be hard. Or what if you had 32 brains in your head and the only way they could talk to one another was through your mouth? So one of them would have to take over your mouth, say something, another of them would have to take over your ear and listen to what the other one said and then think about it and then say something back by taking over the mouth. The, the, see what I'm getting at? Would that be efficient? No. But what if instead they could all talk to each other inside your head and didn't have to use your mouth and your ear? That could be faster. Okay. So then the next question becomes, well, what if they all want to listen and talk at the same time, like to somebody else? What if my 32 brains all want to talk to you? Or wait a minute, what if 16 of my brains want to talk to you, and eight of my brains want to talk to you, and eight of my brains want to talk to you? How's that going to go? Is that going to be efficient? No. So it depends on what you're trying to do, how you're trying to do it, and how they hook together, whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. On the other hand, is having one brain that goes twice as fast a good thing or bad? How many of you vote one brain twice as fast, that's good? That's bad. It depends. I'm going to vote that that's good, right? The same brain going twice as fast. So in the olden days, the way that we got chips to speed up was we would double the speed that each thing happened. So we would double what we call the clock speed, the gigahertz. How many of you seen that gigahertz rating for a chip? Right? In the olden days, they would brag. Oh, it was, we, well, in 1998, I bought a, a PC that had a Pentium 3 at 350, a 50, I'm sorry, Pentium 2 at 350 megahertz, right? And then a couple of years later, you could buy a Pentium 3 at 700 megahertz. And then a couple of years after that, you could buy a Pentium 3 at 1.4 gigahertz, double the speed of the previous one, right? And then 2.8. How many of you have heard of a 5.6 gigahertz chip? 5 gigahertz? 4 gigahertz? 3 gigahertz? Have you heard? 3? There are 3. Okay, so you do see 3. Very rarely do you see 4, and I've never seen a 5. I've never seen a 5 gigahertz chip. Why did they stop? Why didn't they keep going and just make chips faster by making the clock run faster? Anybody know? Yes, it is about physics. That's correct, Ringer. Okay, so here's what the problem is. When you speed up the clock speed, so if I go from two gigahertz to four gigahertz, when you speed up the clock speed, by the way, we'll talk about what clock speed means next week, but when you speed up the clock speed, so when things happen faster, you run hotter. Is that good or bad? That's bad, because if you run too hot, what happens to your chips? By the way, how many of you have held a laptop on your bare lap, like you're wearing shorts, and you put the laptop on your lap. How's it feel? It's warm. It's warm. So here's the problem. The heat dissipation of a chip is not proportional to the clock speed. It is proportional to the square of the clock speed. So if I go from two gigahertz to four gigahertz, I don't increase the heat by a factor of two. I increase the heat by a factor of four, okay? Now you can start to see what the problem is. So those of you who've held a laptop on your lap know that a laptop today runs at about the heat of a hairdryer. And that's about the upper limit of what we're willing to tolerate. And frankly, the upper limit of what a plastic case is gonna be able to manage. Because the next stage after hairdryer is nuclear reactor, followed by the sun. So how many of you would buy a laptop if it ran as hot as a nuclear reactor? Okay, none of you are that dumb, that's good. All right, so we stopped increasing the clock speed 
because increasing the clock speed made it impossible to afford the laptop. You'd have to get like super cooling. Yes, question. Well, and also wouldn't it affect the, the actual hardware itself? It would, I mean, at some point, it's going to ruin your hardware. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. In fact, that's the real issue, right? Because in real life, you don't put the laptop on your lap. We've already learned that lesson, right? You, you put the laptop on like a blanket or uh, you get one of those uh, portable little um, trays that you can put on your lap. Yes, question from TV Lab. Yes, can you clarify the difference between processor or CPU and core? Ooh, good, good. Or over what is the chip and what is the processor? Right, so uh, clarify the difference between chip, processor, and core. So here is the difference. From now on, forever for the rest of your life, I forbid you to use the word processor anymore for a very important reason. From now on, that word is too ambiguous to be used in like the polite company anymore, okay? So if I say processor, do I mean the chip or do I mean the core? Or can you not tell when I say it? You can't tell. You can sometimes, you can kind of tease out from context what I probably mean but it's not a good word anymore. We're going to stop using, we're not going to say processor, we're not going to say CPU, we're not going to say any of those terms anymore. We're going to say chip, which means the whole thing that you can physically pick up, and we're going to say core, which is the piece of it that's an independent brain. Okay? Now, the term of art in the world of computing is not chip, it's socket, because the socket is the place on the board, on the motherboard, that you stick the chip in. So they will say, this is a two-socket server, or this is a four-socket or a one-socket server. And when you hear them use the word socket, what you know they mean is the number of chips. Now, in theory, you don't have to populate every socket. In practice, if you're not going to populate them all, you probably buy fewer sockets, you probably buy a cheaper server. Because a one socket server is cheaper than a two socket server, and a two socket server is cheaper than a four socket server. So if you're not going to use all four of them, you're probably not going to spend the money on that. All right, anyway, so the, the question is, what's the difference between a core and a chip? The chip is the thing you can physically pick up. Inside that chip are many cores. Okay. All right, where was I? I totally forgot the point I was making, but it was, I'm sure it was fascinating. Heat, right. So. Uh, no, I think we already said that. All right, so heat is bad, and you will die. So we'll leave it at that. So you can't keep increasing the clock speed. In fact, they came back down a bit. So it gone <laughs> up into the three-point-somethings and was just starting to hit four, and they were like, ah, we're going to back off. We're going to go back down to two to three, and we'll keep it in that range. You, you, you see chips down in the one-and-a-half gigahertz range up to, you usually don't see them going all the way up to four anymore. Um, so between one and a half and three point something is about where you typically see it. Okay. All right. So, but this going back to cache. So each level. Let's think about the word cache. What does the word cache mean in real life? What is a cache? C A C H E, not C A S H. I know what C A S H is, and the more of that I can get, the better. What is C A C H E? What does that word mean? Okay, so I'll do another Pirates of the Caribbean. How many of you saw Pirates of the Caribbean, the first one, the good one? Okay. Yes, thank you, okay, exactly. So when they are marooned on the desert island, and Captain Jack Sparrow is explaining how he escaped the desert island, there were rum runners who were using that particular island as a cache for their rum. And then he did that weird thing where he like, knocked on the tree to see if it was hollow, and then he walked like this, right? And eventually, he sort of stamped on the ground, and there was kind of a hollow sound there, and it was a big wooden door, and he opened it up, and there were some stairs. You go down into a hole in the ground, and down in the hole in the ground were a bunch of bottles of rum, right? So what does the word cash mean? What were the rum runners using the islands to do? Store it permanently or store it for a short period? Short period, they don't want, they're not using it as a place to age the rum. They're just using it as a place to drop the rum off until they're ready to deliver it to a, um, a smuggling customer, or as a person say, smuggling operation. Question from TV Land. When we say that we can do over 100 calculations, what does a calculation constitute? Okay, so um, we're looking here at how many calculations could have been done during the time it takes to get data from 
a particular level of cash or from RAM, right? So what does it mean that we could have done 2160 calculations of the time it takes to get data from the RAM? And the answer is there is a particular speed at which calculations could go. And these calculations are specifically adds, subtracts, or multiplies. Those are the calculations that are fast. All other calculations are slower than that. We'll see that, I think, two or three weeks from now. I'll actually show you some real numbers. Um, but all other calculations other than add, subtract, and multiply are quite slow. Add, subtract, and multiply are super fast. Um, so a Skylake chip, for example, can do as many as 32 add, subtracts, and multiplies um, in one tick of the clock. So um, 32 calculations, 2 billion times a second. So that's 64 calculations per second per core. Okay. So if I've got a 32 core chip, then that would be, where was I at? 64, right? 128, 256, 5, 12, 10, 24, 2 trillion calculations per second on a 32 core chip. Wow. Remember that picture last time toward the end of the slides of our first supercomputer, our first cluster supercomputer here at, at OU? And there was a picture of the, a big one that, that was a few years before that at the big national lab, and then ours, and then there was the card, and then there was the chip, right? Okay. So that's how many calculations we're talking about per second in a single chip today at the high end. Yes, question again from TV Land. Is the cache designed to have a constant throughput of Data, example, does the size compensate for the speed that data adds to speed? Is the cache designed to have a constant throughput? Um, in a sense, yeah, I mean, there's a fixed amount of um, time it takes to move data through the cache. Um, the size of the cache, again, is a function of its cost. Uh, so the super fast ones are more expensive, therefore they're not very big and so on. Um, so anyway, so that's why when I say you could do 2160 calculations, what I did was I took this amount of time and multiplied that up by how many you can do per second. And again, this is just per core, right? Multiply that up by the number of cores in a chip, which could be as many as 32 today. And is that number going up, by the way? That number keeps going up, okay? So if you multiply this up by 32, if all of them were stalling on level one on RAM, if all of the cores were waiting for RAM, by the way, does that happen in real life? Everybody's waiting for RAM to deliver data? It totally happens. They're all waiting for RAM to deliver data. They're wasting, what would this be, 64,000 calculations worth of time, right? That's a lot just to bring data in, okay? Which is why we have cash. Okay, so all these numbers should not frighten you. It's a general principle. The general principle is I put something temporarily in the faster place so I can get at it faster when I do need it. But I can only put a limited amount of stuff in the faster place because the faster place is small. Is small, by the way, is it small in the absolute sense or smaller in the relative sense? So, L1 cache, we said, let's roll back for a second. Oh, so here. Okay, um, your slide 29. Okay, so L1, we said the data cache was only 32K. Is that big or small? How many of you vote that's big? How many of you vote that's small? How many of you vote the correct answer is compared to what? Oh! So is level one big or small compared to level two? It's small compared to level two. How about compared to registers? Is it big or small compared to registers? Okay. It's three times the size, level one is three times the size of my registers. Right? And on old computers, it might have been 30 or 100 times the size. Level two, is level two fast or slow? What's the correct answer to that question? Say it again. Compared to what? Okay. Is level two fast or slow compared to level three? It's fast. Is it fast or slow compared to level two? I'm sorry, level one. It's slow. Is it big or small compared to level three? Is it big or small compared to level one? 
Is it, so should I be using the words big and small? What words should I be using instead? So what's the word that means relatively big? Bigger and smaller, exactly. So you should never say big and small, fast and slow. You should say bigger and smaller, faster and slower. And by the way, cheaper and more expensive. Okay? These are all relative comparisons. All right, so again, the numbers are not important. What those numbers are, you're not, you're not here to memorize these clock speeds and all this stuff. That's, that's junk. And that information has a shelf life of two years. And then it's, it's no longer interesting. Not one of you wants to hear about how amazing the chips were that we had in 2005. Not one of you. That is unimportant information. You are completely unimpressed with that. That is the last thing you want to, by the way, I do have some data in here from 2005. But that's just because it took too long to go look up the new data. And a lot of it is not easy to find on the web anymore. Right? Okay, so this one, in fact, is from a chip that was several years ago. This was like three laptops ago. But I ran the test, and I can't find the software I used, so you're stuck with the old data. The principles are the same, by the way. Okay. So latency, time to get the work done, right? So here, by the way, I, I learned this trick from a guy at one of the, one of the supercomputer vendor companies who said he learned it from the marketing folks at his company. Every graph, you always put where better is. So in this case, smaller is better. Right? I've got some other graphs where bigger is better. You'll see the thing there on there. Okay. So here, this is stuff I can squeeze into level one. Look, 32K. Right? Stuff I can squeeze into level one cache. Super fast. Gets done in just one and a half nanoseconds. Okay? Here's stuff that doesn't fit in level one, but does fit in level two. Oh my goodness, right? Okay, so level two here was 256K, right? Stuff that doesn't fit in level one, but does fit in level two. Okay. So that takes, um, in this case, it was seven nanoseconds. And then this particular CPU did not have a level three, just had level one and level two. Okay. So here was getting data from RAM. And you can see there's this very clear stair step, depending on the size of the data. Right? If it's small enough to fit in level one, I can go super fast. If it's small enough to fit in level two, it's not as fast as level one. It's still pretty fast. If it doesn't fit in level two, then I'm out of luck. And it takes much, much longer. Right? Factor of four, and eh, three and a half. Difference in performance. Okay. All right, now let's talk about RAM. How many of you love RAM? Hate RAM. Utterly indifferent to RAM. You should love RAM. Okay? You know why you should love RAM? Because RAM is A, cheap and B, something you get to control how much you have. So this laptop here came with four gigabytes of RAM, and it has room for two RAM sticks, and a particular CPU in there can handle RAM sticks up to size eight gig. So I got on the web, and I bought, did I buy one or two? I bought two. See, that seems the logical answer, doesn't it? Right? So if I have two, so I started with four gig, if I buy two 8 gig RAM sticks, I end up with how much? No, I've only got two slots. So what am I going to have to do with the four? If I buy two eights, what do I have to do with the four? I have to throw it away, right? Well, I mean, I can put it in a museum case. How many of you care so much about RAM sticks that you would put it in a museum case and display it for all your friends to see, oh, look at my four gig. Now, nobody cares, right? So I would have to throw it away, right? If I don't, if I only buy one 8 gig RAM stick, and I already have a four in there, and I've got two slots, now how much RAM do I have? 12. If I buy two RAM sticks, how much, space, how much RAM do I have? 16. So how much more will I have compared to buying this one? A third more, right? So I don't double the amount of space that I have if I buy the second RAM stick. I only increase it by 33%, not 100%. So I couldn't, I couldn't justify the extra cost, right? These, these RAM sticks, because I had to buy them from someone, they, they had to be certified. Uh, the RAM sticks uh, were fairly expensive. They were over $100 each. And I, I couldn't justify the extra 100 bucks, right? So I got to 12 gig. And the thing I did before buying them, by the way, this is all relevant to the topic we're talking about today. I'm not just bragging about my brilliance, though I am doing that. 
But I'm not just, I'm not merely doing that. I actually called the company and I said, if I have a four and an eight, will that slow my laptop down? And we actually had to ask somebody. And the answer turned out to be no, it'll run just as fast as two eights or two fours. So um, I put the eight in there and for half the money, I got almost as good performance. So that's not bad, it's not a bad place to be. All right, so what's RAM? What does that stand for, R-A-M? What is that short for? Random access memory. Random access memory, exactly correct. What does it mean, random access? Did we talk about this last week? Okay, we've already talked about this, so I'm not gonna waste your time on that. Okay, now I gotta tell you, uh, by the way, in real life, which of these is the case? Technical jargon is always simple, consistent, and unambiguous, or technical jargon is a random jumble of junk. Yeah, it's the second one, absolutely. So we already agreed what a core was, right? It's a brain inside a chip, okay? But in the olden days, when they didn't have multiple brains inside the chip, they didn't have this problem. So they had, um, they used the word core to refer to RAM. How many of you have used a Linux machine or some flavor of you? Okay, have you ever had what's called a core dump where a file appears in that directory when your program crashes and it's either just named core or it's core dot some number? Okay, you've seen that. What is that? That's the RAM dump. It dumped the contents of all the RAM you were using into a file. Why would it do that, by the way? Uh, to help you debug. Is, it, it, um, do you use the core file when you're trying to debug? Um, no. Almost nobody does. Only the real experts use it. Nonetheless, um, Unix is trying to be helpful. Was Unix designed for novices or experts? It was designed for experts. There's a joke about this. So the guy who invented Unix, he has this car, and the dashboard of the car has one indicator light. It's a question mark. And if that indicator light lights up, and you don't know why it's lighting up, you shouldn't have been driving the car in the first place. So Unix is not user friendly, Unix is user hostile. Right? Uh, but having said that, so the term core was used way back in the oh, 60s or 70s as a, it must have been actually the 50s, um, as a term to mean RAM. And the word, where that came from was for a period of time, RAM was made of little tiny magne magnetic cores, they called them, little tiny magnets. Okay, they don't make it of that anymore, but the term, we're stuck with the term, we're stuck with the word, okay? So um, you sometimes hear that term um, tossed around. Anyway, so RAM is where data live when they're um, being used by a program that's currently running, so my slides currently are in RAM, okay? Um, and of course, it's slower, than any level of cache, therefore it's cheaper than any level of cache, therefore it's bigger than any level of cache. Okay. So what does RAM look like? So I want you to imagine that everybody in the world, all seven some billion of us, each and every one of us, man, woman, and child, has our own house, and every single one of those seven billion houses is all on the same street. So far so good? Okay. Now, uh, by the way, if there are seven billion of us, we each have our own house, and all those houses are on the same street, what is the name of that street? Is it Elm Street? Is it Robinson Avenue? What do we call that street? It's just the street, right? You don't bother to give it a name because there's only the one, right? It's just the street, okay. So every one of us lives on a, in a house on the street. And by the way, the numbering for the houses on the street, there's no halves. There's no like 27 and a half the street. There's just integer numbers. And they are consecutive. So you don't go from like 253 to 264. You go from 253 to 254, from 254 to 255, and so on. So that's good. And one more thing, the address of the very first house on the street is zero. Okay? Because computer scientists are insane. Okay? So that's RAM. And no matter what you do with the RAM, that's actually how RAM works. RAM is one long street with consecutive addresses, all integers starting at zero. Okay? So far, so good? So um, how many of you know what an array is in programming? Okay? So RAM is a 1D array. That's the way to think of it. Okay, now let's talk about the relationship 
between RAM and cache. And we saw these slides last time. So again, my actual laptop number is not made up. This is actually true. So my CPU, I could chew through over 650 gigabytes per second if I could keep it fed, but my RAM can only move about 15 gigabytes per second. So what is that? Two and a half percent as fast as my CPU. So my RAM is deciding how fast the work gets done. Well, but engineers are endlessly clever and creative. How many of you are engineers or engineers to be? Aha, are you endlessly clever and creative? Say yes. Yes. Good. Never be shy about shameless self-promotion. Trust me, I know. Shameless self-promotion. Yes, of course you are a genius. And of course you come up with clever solutions. Because engineers, engineering is all about designing exciting, helpful, useful things, right? So you come up with clever solutions. So the computer engineers came up with a clever solution. They said, let's put something faster. Oh, we can't afford much of it because since it's faster, it's more expensive. But a little bit of something in between that's faster. So if we can get the data we need into cache before we need them, then we can move much faster on our calculations. So cache means a small place to hold things temporarily that's faster to get at when you need it, right? And that's true whether what you're storing is RUM or data. It's the same principle, okay? So faster, therefore more expensive, therefore small. Okay, so now notice, this time better is up because this is how fast it goes, how many bits per second, or in this case megabytes, but after all, a megabyte is just a lot of bits. Okay, so if I can fit it in level one cache, it's super fast. And again, this is on a chip from several laptops ago. Super fast, I can get as fast as 14 gigabytes per second on my level one cache. If it won't fit in level one, but it will fit in level two, again, that's 256K, it'll fit in level two, then I can get it done pretty fast. Right, about half the speed of the level one. But if it doesn't fit in cache, again, this chip only had level one and level two. If it doesn't fit in cache, then I'm getting less than half the speed of the level two cache if I have to draw the data from RAM. And that, by the way, is for reading. Reading typically is faster. Notice in cache, read and write are about the same speed. So the white circles versus the black triangles, okay, they're about the same speed read and write in cache, but when you get to RAM, read is much faster than write. In fact, it's about, it's more than double. It's about two and a half times. Okay, so my write, I can only write at 1.4 gigabytes per second, so much slower than anything else. Okay. So if I can keep my data in cache when I need them, then I can get the work done a lot faster, a lot faster. Is it good to get work done faster? Yes, because time is? Exactly correct, good. All right, a little bit of jargon. A cache hit when you need a particular piece of data from a particular location, a particular address in memory, the, the data is already in cache when you need it. Does that make us happy when we have a cache hit? We're super happy. We love our cache hits. Okay? What's the opposite of a cache hit? A cache miss. So do cache misses make us happy or unhappy? Unhappy. Because if it's not in cache, where do we have to go? We have to go to RAM, and RAM is so much slower. Look at, we have the, we have the thing, right? Look, it was less than half the speed to read something from RAM than to read it from level two cache, right? Okay. So we want it to be in cache. We love it to be in cache. Will it be in cache? What are the chances of being in cache? How big is the RAM on your laptop, do you know? It's 12. 12 gig, oh, just like mine, no, see? We're RAM twins? Okay, weird. Um, right, so 12 gig of RAM. How much cache do you have? Not sure? I will tell you the answer. A handful of megabytes, okay? So my PowerPoint slides, I'm guessing are probably tens or hundreds of megabytes. Will they fit in my cache? All of them. No. So. If I can't get them all in cache, what am I going to do? We're going to have to go back to RAM when we need them. So have you ever had this thing where 
you're doing the PowerPoint at the beginning, you go through just in case you look through and they're slow to load. But then the next time you go through, they load much faster. Ooh, maybe some of them ended up in cache. Or maybe they were on disk and they loaded into RAM, right? Because after all, um, is RAM faster or slower than disk? So can it be used as a cache for disk? Ooh, is disk faster or slower than the internet? Think about the internet for a minute. Is the internet fast or slow? It's super slow. How many of you have had that experience? It's super slow. The internet is already full, right? Okay. So is your disk faster than the internet? Typically it is. So have you ever seen that thing where um, your, your browser says cache? What's the cache of your browser? Uh -huh. And where does it live physically? Where does what you're caching from your browser live? Uh, say it again. It lives on your disk because your disk is faster than the internet. Exactly. So is cache an absolute term or a relative term? It's a relative term, right? So your CPU has CPU cache, but your RAM is also cache. It's cache for who? For what? For your disk, exactly. And your disk is also cache. It's cache for who? It's cache for the internet, okay? We're only talking about CPU cache right now, which is the cache for your RAM. By the way, notice, level one cache is the cache for who? Other direction. What comes immediately after level one? What's the next step? Level two. Level one cache is actually the cache for level two cache. Level two cache is the cache for who? Level three cache. Level three cache is that cache for who? RAM, unless you have a level four cache, then your level three cache is the cache for level four, and your level four cache is the cache for RAM. How many levels can we go in theory? What's the upper limit on how many levels your storage hierarchy can have? There's no upper limit, right? Just depends on how much technology you've got and um, how much time you have to spend on it and money, okay? All right, so if all of your data happened to be able to squeeze into cache, then, would you ever get a cache miss? I'm going to carefully define the word ever to include everything except the beginning. Because at the beginning, will you get cache misses? Yeah, you totally will. But once you've loaded it, then you're golden. And it'll just stay there until you're done chewing on it, right? And so your stuff will go super fast. But what if your data are not small enough to fit in cache? By the way, in real life, which is more common? Does fit in cache or don't fit in cache? does not fit in cache is the more common situation, right? How many of you have applications uh, that take up more than a gigabyte of RAM total? How many of you are not sure? Okay, you'll find out. So it turns out most applications use more than a gigabyte, which means they use way more than 30 or 40 megabytes, which is what you typically have as cache. Uh, sorry, horse? Firefox. Okay, I'm not going to get into that one. <laughs> no, 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 I'm not going to get drawn into that. No, no. Okay, okay, so if it doesn't fit in cash, are we going to get into trouble? Well, let's go deeper. Okay. By the way, what time is it, Debbie? I want to make sure I'm not too far off. 127. Oh, we're out of time. We're literally out of time. I'm on slide 41. I'm halfway through. We need to take a vote. Okay. Continue with this next week because we've got several weeks padding the semester to make room, right? The last three I have to be announced, meaning I haven't thought about it yet, okay? Um, continue with this next week and finish this off, part two, or move on to the next topic, which is a topic about parallelism. How many vote continue with this and get it, get it slammed out? Skip the rest of this and go on to parallelism. Okay, so it's about even, so here's what I'm gonna do. People in TV land, there are roughly a thousand of you. You get to vote. If you think we should do one or the other and you care deeply, send an email to supercomputing in plain English, all one word, at gmail.com. If you don't care, don't bother sending the email because I've got lots of other emails to slot for you. Okay? Um, and if nobody, if it's roughly a tie, then I get to decide. Okay? Is that fair? All right. So we'll pick this up. 
next week, and either we'll learn about cash lines, or we will start to learn about what's called instruction level parallelism. Are we excited? Yeah. All right. Either way, it's a win for you. Okay. How many of you have fun? If you want to have more fun, what do you have to do? Come back when? What time? Excellent. I'll look forward to it. Are there any more questions in TV land? Uh, one said continue, the other one says... Okay, so we're running 50-50? <laughs> okay, I'm going to see how this plays out. By the way, I may not respond to you when you send your vote, because if a thousand of you send me your votes, I do not have time to thank you for sending your vote. So you may get no response. It doesn't mean I don't love you. It just means I have a grant proposal. So Two of them. More to, uh, um, to, uh, right, now. right now, there are more for instructional level parallelism than more uh, about the story hierarchy. Right. Okay. I I'm a little skeptical, but I will make a decision. Sure will All right. Thank you, everybody. And we'll pick it up next week, and we'll have lots of fun next week. And I'm going to turn off recording.